tonight I have James Duff Lyle with me, who's the executive director of the ACLU Vermont. Hi, Duff, and I call him Duff. How are you, Duff? I'm good, Melinda. Nice How are to you? see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You bet. Thanks for driving all the way up here from Montpelier. No problem. It's yeah. Great to be here. I'm really glad you're here because we have a lot of things to talk about in this half hour. We do. We do. I mean, the ACLU is doing a lot of great work, and the ACLU, ACLU Vermont is doing a lot of great work, too. And you've got your 50th year anniversary coming up. Yes, that's right. right. We this are in Saturday. Our, we are in our 50th year. The ACLU of Vermont was founded in 1967. So um, this week we're going to be looking back over five decades in defense of civil rights in Vermont. Wow. Yeah. And the ACLU nationally is 100 years old. Coming up on it. On 100. Yeah, yeah. So you're having an event down in Montpelier, right? Yeah, we have our annual membership meeting um, yeah. where, again, we're going to be kind of Looking back over some of the highlights from five decades, um, as some of the highs and lows, I guess, um, and just celebrating, um, you know, the, the work of some of the founding members who 50 years ago came together at a time when the country was really divided, where civil rights were really contested, where people were really worried about the direction of the country. I don't know if that sounds at all familiar, but... Well, I was part of that movement. Right. I'm an old hippie. Well, if you, so and out of that grew the ACLU, the ACLU in, in Vermont. In Vermont. And, and, you know, the, the, the work that has, has flowed from that and the, the, from that initial seed has been, is pretty remarkable. And, and well, we're going to talk about that, but, you know, before we go there, I'd like to learn about you. So, because you're new to the job, you've been there for a couple of years, right? Just over a year, yeah. Or just over a year, and it seems like longer because I feel like I like I know you like a brother. It's been a long year, um, Melinda. But it's, it has been a long year, but I feel like you've been here a long time. You've done a lot of great work, which we're going to get into. You. But talk to us a little bit about who you are, where you come from, a little bit about your background, and why you ended up in this social justice work, because you are a lawyer. Yes. You have your law degree from Georgetown. Georgetown. There you go. And you could have gone into private practice and certainly mm -hmm. made a lot more money than you do as the director of the ACLU Vermont. That's true. So what inspires someone like you to take up this work of protecting the civil uh, civil liberties of our citizens? Um, well, uh, so, so I'm from New England. I'm from southern Massachusetts. I went to school in Vermont. I have family in Vermont. Um, so I've been... What brought you to school in Vermont? Where'd you go in Vermont? I went to Middlebury College. You, so you went to college in Middlebury? Uh -huh. Okay, you're a Middlebury grad. That's right. And my father's lived in Vermont the last 20 years, so I've been in and out of the state a lot. Um, and it is wonderful to be back. Uh, living here. Living here, yes. yes. Um, no, it's, it's, it's really... Uh, I couldn't be happier glad to, to be back in here. Vermont. Yeah. Um, but so I don't know, how did I get into this work? I mean, I, around the time that I graduated from Middlebury it was um, back in 2000. Where'd you go to law school? Went you to went to Georgetown. Georgetown. Mm -hmm. So was it, you went to, to law school and were you following the social justice path or were you pretty much, I'm gonna be a, what was your, did you specialize in anything in law school that? Well, so I graduated in 2000, I went to law school in 2004 and that was of course around the time of the Bush administration and um, the second Bush administration, um, and 9-11, and the response to that, and the so-called war on terror, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, and all this stuff was happening. And I, like many of my classmates in law school, were really concerned uh, and saw a whole lot of government excess and abuse and a trampling of civil rights in this country and really around the world, and saw that as a real threat to human rights, and we did not like that, and saw law school as one way, uh, among many, but one way to try to uh, counter that or respond to that. Um, and, you know, I think it was just consistent with uh, something that I've always had, just a kind of an aversion to the abuse of authority, um, and certainly saw that um, coming from the Bush administration, and, and of course we are certainly seeing that now uh, with uh, the current administration. So, that, I mean, that's essentially where I went to law school, and that's why the ACLU uh, made a lot of sense for me, this is an organization that specializes in holding government accountable. If you know, if I had to summarize it in just one phrase, that so is, that's what the ACLU does. That is what it does. But was there anybody in your family or any your family uh, beliefs, your family values that inspired you to move into this social justice work, protecting people's civil rights? No, I, I mean, I was raised by, you know, good, decent people with good values, but, um, you know, I, I just think I have personally always had a, a visceral reaction to injustice. I remember that from an early age um, in history class. 
Um, and, but I mean, I wasn't thinking about it a whole lot growing up, and even in college, I was an art major at Middlebury. No kidding. Um, well, no. so, are you, wow, I want to see your artwork. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Not a very successful one. Uh, my, my art professors helped steer me on a path other than art. Uh, to law to, school. To law school, so. Wow. Um, but no, I mean, it was uh, as much um, in response to what was happening historically, and as I say, real echoes with what's happening now um, at, the, at the federal level with, with this administration, just a, a real concern of um, you know, the abandonment of core American values and, and laws um, that were really under attack after 9-11 and that are still very much under attack today. So we're going to get deeper into that, but uh, what did you do after Georgetown? Where'd you end up? Um, well, I started out, uh, my first job out of law school was at a, a little nonprofit called the Esperanza Immigrant Rights Project in Los Angeles. Um, I defended uh, immigrant children who were in deportation proceedings. A lot of people do not know that immigrants are not entitled to an attorney when they're facing deportation and removal proceedings, and that includes children. That, in that could include infants. Uh, do not have the right to an attorney unless it's provided for them by an organization like Esperanza. Um, and of course, people without legal representation have a much harder time uh, succeeding, uh, winning their cases. Uh, so anyway, I, I represented um, dozens of uh, unaccompanied, undocumented uh, children, um, won a lot of green cards, and, and then eventually moved on to the ACLU in Arizona uh, before, as a staff attorney before coming here uh, last year to, to be the director of the Vermont Affiliate. Wow, what a great journey. Yeah, what it's a great it, journey. It's it's been uh, it's been an adventure. And now you've landed, and we're really lucky to have you. I can't believe it's only been a year. Like I said, it's great to be here. It is great to have you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the ACLU and the history and the mission for my viewers out there. Uh, it's the American Civil Liberties Union. It's a C4, right? Did you say it was a C4? Or well, we have a C4 and a C3. A C3. Uh, we have kind of our lobbying side is the C4, and then our, our other advocacy and a lot of the other stuff we do is, is C3. So let's, so 100 years. So it's been around since 1917. Um, the National. So the, the National so ACLU was founded in 1920, so okay, coming up on the, on the centennial of the National ACLU. So let's talk about the, uh, the history of the ACLU nationally, because a lot of my viewers out there may not know. Uh, I'm sure you're hearing a lot about the ACLU right now because of the work they're doing um, on the ban, the, um, the, the immigrant ban. So, but let's talk about the history a little bit and this organization and how it got started. Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the ACLU was founded in 1920, um, sort of at the height of the, the Red Scare and the Palmer Raids and um, a huge crackdown on war resistors uh, during World War I and the found and uh, yeah, big uh, crackdown and, and hostility towards uh, union uh, organizers. Um, when the ACLU was founded in 1920, there had yet to uh, be a single free speech case decided at the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, the idea of free speech was uh, really non-existent. It wasn't recognized by the courts, and the general public was didn't have strong opinions or, or, or were outright hostile to the idea that people had free speech rights, that union workers had free speech okay. rights. Um, wow. We've come a long way. Well, we have, and yeah. the ACLU had a huge role over decades in changing that, in eventually first shifting public opinion uh, about the importance of the freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, other First Amendment protected rights, um, eventually bringing more and more cases to the U.S. Supreme Court to establish um, free speech rights. Um, and of course, you know, today it's, it's a very well-established uh, right, uh, but it hasn't always been that way. And I mean, that was one of the, the key um, fights um, at, at the outset. Um, but in the years since, over you know, the almost 100 years since then, the ACLU has broadened its scope really to take on anything that comes under the purview of the Bill of Rights and constitutional rights. Um, we work every day um, in courts, in legislators, in communities to um, to win the maximum protections possible under the Constitution for as many people as possible, for all people. For all people. Um, regardless of background, regardless of ideology. Um, income. We, uh, in, income, nationality, um, really any characteristic. The ACLU uh, in Vermont and nationally uh, represents people across the political spectrum um, from all walks of life. Um, really, as I say, to, to try to maximize constitutional freedoms and to protect people's rights when they are uh, trampled on or threatened by government actors. That's what we do. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. 
So um, highlight for me, so let's talk a little bit about the ACLU Vermont that's 50 years old. Um, you're celebrating this Saturday. Mm -hmm. What over the last 50 years were some of the big issues that you had to face in Vermont? Where was Vermont 50 years ago? Well, Vermont has come a long way. In 1967. I was 17 back then. Wow. Oh, my. I was not yet born. You weren't born yet. Um, but um, I, since I've arrived uh, a little over a year ago, I've been studying up on the history of the organization and also in preparation for this, our 50th year. So um, I've learned a lot, and it's a fascinating history. Um, I mean, a lot of people don't necessarily remember or realize how far Vermont has come. Um, uh, when the ACLU was founded in 1967, one of the first, uh, ACLU of Vermont was founded in 1967, one of the first cases we took on was uh, the case of an Essex Junction librarian um, who was challenging a loyalty oath that was still required of state employees at the time. People had to, had to make loyalty oaths. Again, this is during the time of the you know, communist scare. Um, three years... So was it a loyalty oath that you were not a communist? Yeah. Is that what it was? Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of our viewers may not know what a loyalty oath is. Mm -hmm. Well, you still hear about loyalty oaths even to this day. Uh, you know, history um, doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it rhymes. And so we, we at that time, loyalty oaths were about yeah, anti-communism. Anti-communism. Um, three years after the founding, the ACLU joined a legal challenge to overturn Vermont's ban on abortions. Um, a major reproductive freedom victory um, in 1970. Uh, in the years since, um, as I say, we've represented people from across the political spectrum. We've represented police officers who were uh, fired for criticizing their superiors. We've represented um, postal workers and Marines who were uh, discharged because they were pregnant. Uh, we've fired, uh, I mean, we've uh, represented students, uh, journalists, um, people targeted, uh, uh, repeatedly targeted with uh, 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 excessive use of force or racial profiling by police. We've represented prisoners in class action lawsuits challenging uh, horrific conditions of confinement in Vermont's prisons. Um, case, I mean, we've had some big, we've had cases go to the Supreme Court. Um, one of the biggest cases here in Vermont at the, the Vermont Supreme Court was the Brigham case, which uh, es essentially um, led to the creation of the Vermont uh, school funding system, which is one of the most now one of the most equitable uh, school funding uh, arrangements through Act, six, through Act 60 uh, in the country, um, something that Vermonters are rightly very proud of. Um, so, you know, the ACLU there had a, a hand time, in all of that. There was a time when school teachers weren't allowed to be married. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was a mm -hmm. time when police were conducting roadside strip searches. Oh, um, stop. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, uh, the ACLU has had a big hand in the direction of this state when it comes to constitutional rights and civil rights. Um, and, you know, I, I fully expect that we will continue to have a big role to play because as far as we have come uh, in, in those five decades, it is also very clear that we still have a very long way to go to realize um, you know, the promise of true justice and equality for everybody in this state. Well, and certainly nationally right now, I mean, with what's going That's on, well. right? Yes. So I just want to tell my viewers that I'm meeting with James Duff Lyle, who is the director of the American Civil Liberties Union, Vermont. Um, their offices are in Montpelier, and their website is acluvt.org. Visit their website. I'll learn about what's uh, happening down um, uh, with all the work that the ACLU of Vermont is doing. Um, and also donate. I mean, if you support the work of the ACLU, I encourage you to go on their website and make a donation. Um, if you can't access a website or don't have the ability to access the website, their phone number is 802-223-6304. Um, also, if you have something you want to talk to them about that might be happening in your life that you think they need to know about. So there you go. That's the contact information. I'll bring it up again later in the show. Um, let's talk a little bit about what's going on uh, in a couple things in Burlington, because I know I've been reading about that, about a couple of the issues that have been going on in the city of Burlington and the state of Vermont mm -hmm. right now that you're working on. You want to share with us a little bit about what, what policies and issues that you're taking on, you're yeah. focused on? Yeah. So, um, you know, the ACLU, frankly, has... Um, concerns about some of the actions uh, undertaken by the city of Burlington in recent years with regards to um, the homeless population, people living in, in um, the city, um, many with substance abuse problems, mental illness. Um, uh, and, you know, we 
absolutely recognize um, that city officials and city residents have, have serious concerns about public safety, about quality of life, um, and we do not uh, for a moment assume that these are easy questions uh, or problems with easy answers. Um, that being said, we, we do have concerns about some of the responses proposed and pursued by the city in recent years. I mean, we have one pending lawsuit against the city of Burlington uh, on behalf of a man, Joe Montagno, um, who after years of homelessness, um, finally found housing um, in the city and was, um, wasn't very good housing. Uh, he was being harassed by his neighbors. Um, he suffered assaults and break-ins and, and those sorts of things. So he was calling the police a lot. And rather than assist him or get in touch with him to work through the fact that he was calling the police an awful lot, um, the city went behind his back to his landlord and had him evicted. Um, and he found himself back out on the street after years of homelessness. He was homeless again. Um, and this is, you know, this is essentially something that, uh, well, it's something that we've seen in other um, cities and towns around the country um, where uh, using nu nuisance ordinances, um, cities will essentially intervene to have people uh, evicted if they're calling the police too frequently. Well, one of the problems with this is people calling the police frequently are often doing that for a reason. That includes victims of domestic violence. Um, we had a client, you had a client in Arizona who was a victim of domestic violence. He was calling the police a lot. And rather than help her, they had her evicted. Um, so, you know, we reached out to the city to try and resolve that. And unfortunately, that, um, that didn't happen. And, and so we are litigating that case. Um, more recently, there, I mean, currently the city council is considering a proposal uh, to possibly criminalize some low-level code infractions, repeat uh, violations of things like littering or public drunkenness, um, which, I mean, again, we recognize that there uh, are real problems facing the city of Burlington, um, but criminalization of, of... What does that mean, criminalization? criminalization? Well, currently, if you, if, you, if you are littering, repeatedly littering, that's a civil what code. What does that literally mean, just throwing a piece of paper on the ground? Or, yeah. or something like public urination or public drunkenness is a civil code violation. That's not something that's going to yet result in prison time. Okay. Um, and essentially, the city is considering changing that. Um, and to make it a criminal to offense? To make it a criminal offense if it's re done repeatedly. Repeatedly. Um, you know, another thing that's in the news right now is are the, the planned evictions of some homeless encampments in the city um, where, you know, the, the city shelters are full. These are people who have nowhere else to go um, and they're being threatened with eviction and in the process of being evicted, their, their belongings are likely to be confiscated uh, or possibly destroyed. Um, and so we've communicated, con communicated our concerns about that to the city, about the, um, you know, the, the criminalization of low level offenses. Um, and again, we do not for a moment um, uh, suggest that these are easy problems to solve. Um, but at the same time, the, it's clear to us that there are limits to what the city can do, and, and they do not include violating the constitutional rights of the homeless population. That's where the ACLU is going to get involved. Um, and, you know, we, we hope that we can work with the city towards real solutions, recognizing that, that, that they're not easy to come by. But I mean, the fact is cities and towns around the country um, have been pursuing a variety of creative solutions to try to get help to people in need. Uh, and city officials are, are pretty forthright about the fact that we need to address the root causes of these problems, that we need to provide better services. The governor has said this recently, and we hope we'll follow up uh, on the promise to improve mental health services. There's clearly a need. As many services as there are provided currently, it's clearly not enough. Um, the city shouldn't have to figure it out all by itself. Um, but one thing it can't do is violate the constitutional rights of its residents. Can and you share some of the solutions that you've read about in other towns and cities that... Sure. I mean, there's a... About what other people are doing? Well, there's a variety of uh, kind of diversion programs that divert people who are cited or arrested um, 
out of the traditional criminal justice system, so they're not just filling prison beds. Um, you know, there is a re as many uh, services there are, there's still a very real need for caseworkers, for social workers, for services, for um, substance abuse treatment programs. Uh, there's a need for beds for all of the, I mean, there's wonderful work being done in the city to, to care for people in need and to provide services that people need. Um, but the shelters are full. I mean, there aren't, there isn't enough being done um, to um, to adequately meet the need. Um, and simply pursuing people, evicting them from where they're squatting, or throwing the book at them and locking, you know, locking them up and throwing away the key, isn't a long-term viable solution. And we, you know, we really hope that a city that does the city have to provide them with with I mean, do do they get provided with legal support if something like that happens? Do they do they get a, a you know an, an attorney appointed to them if they end up? It and depends they, they on can't the, afford a, a, they can't afford a lawyer. Right. I mean, it depends on the offense. It, it, certain offenses, yes. Other others, not. Um, but you know, again, I, I, I my hope is that um, the city will start to um, pursue uh, new strategies, additional strategies um, that don't involve uh, civil rights violations or putting people um, in jail. I guess is what you're saying. I mean, because changing an ordinance, they have the right to change right. an ordinance, right? That right. says we're going to. The city council can change it. it. Says, okay, if you urinate it probably three or four times, and you're going to be arrested. I mean, they they have the right to do that, but right. I mean, they can cite people for that, and then I think there's a lot of things that they can do subsequent to that. But what we don't think is going to help is sending them to Prison. jail, yeah. where they're not going to be getting any of the services that they might need, and where sooner or later they're going to wind up back out on the street worse off than they were before. Right. And that's not good for them. That's not good for anybody in this community. So where are you with your discussions with the city of Burlington to try to come to some common ground on this with the city council? Because assume, I'm assuming this is coming to a vote mm, yeah, in the near future. We submitted or? a letter to city council. Um, I published an op-ed in the free press um, within the last couple of days. We've sent a letter to um, the mayor and, and council and police chief about the evictions issue. Um, and you This know, is the eviction out of the... The place that there are folks multiple are homeless okay. encampments okay. that are that are facing eviction, and you know we're always willing and eager to to discuss this with the city, and I, and I hope that we have the opportunity to do that. So basically, what we're saying is uh, for the city of Burlington and city councilors and uh, to call you know James Duff Lyle down at the ACLU 802-223-6304. <laughs> okay and set up an opportunity to meet and talk about these issues and see if you can resolve it without um, incringing on people's civil liberties, right? That's right, that's right. That's Is right. that your hope? Yeah, and uh, you know, I think it's also, you know, to put it in a little more context, um, you know, many people in this country across the political spectrum are calling for broad criminal justice reforms. I mean, you even hear city officials talking about that. State mm -hmm. officials are very mm -hmm. interested in bail reform and sentencing reform. Um, people are looking at prosecutors uh, across the country and their role in fueling uh, what has become a, a, an epidemic of mass incarceration. We have you know, 2.3 million people incarcerated mm -hmm. in this country. Um, Vermont's prison population has tripled since the 1980s. Um, there are massive racial disparities in Vermont's prison population and it's in the prison system. Um, we're not going to solve those problems by adding additional criminal penalties. Um, really, we need to be moving in the opposite direction, and a lot of people are. The ACLU has launched a campaign for smart justice uh, nationally. We're going to be rolling that out here in Vermont in the coming year, again, with, with, um, well, with the goal of cutting the prison population in half which we think we can do through a combination of bail reform, sentencing reform, um, and, and you know, really looking at... Diversion. Who, yeah. I mean, T.J. Donovan is, a, is, is all about diversion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, T.J. Donovan put in place a number of reforms um, to, to divert people out of uh, the criminal justice system. Um, I think one issue is that's not necessarily in place statewide, and you see um, real disparities statewide, county to county, in terms of who's going to jail, who's going to prison, for how long, why, uh, what the demographics are. Have you and done part, that study? Well, part of the problem, I, you know, I was going to say, is we don't have a lot of data uh, yes. from, from the courts. We, we have some from the Department of Corrections, um, but that data is not um, 
analyzed or collected in the way that it once was. We are trying to work with the Department of Corrections to obtain and analyze it. Um, I mean, we have extensive police data. Police across the state are collecting data on police stops, and so we know that racial profiling is a major problem statewide. But we know less about the decisions that are being made, the sentences that are being handed down, the makeup of Vermont's prison population, and you know we need to understand that better if we're going to fix the problem. But knowing what we do know, we are pretty confident, A, Vermont should not be leading the nation in um, the, the incarceration rate of African-American men. Uh, Vermont is the and worst. We? In, we're the worst in the country. We're the worst in the country. Um, Vermont should not be locking up people um, simply because they don't have money for bail, for no other reason than they do not have money for bail, and that is happening. Well, also, so, the, also, I want to express something that concerns me, is that women in the prison cannot get out if they don't have a place to, maybe this is for all people in prison, that they can't get out if they don't have a place to go, mm -hmm. to live. Mm -hmm. And what happens with women when they're imprisoned is their families abandon them more than with men because their boyfriends will leave them and women will tend to stay more devoted to a man in prison than the other way around. Yeah. And so these women can't even get out of prison because they don't have a place to live because their families have abandoned them. Because for whatever reason, our society, if a woman goes to prison, they're treated in a different way than, than men are. And they can't even get out of prison if they don't have a place to live. Yeah. And I mean, you've touched on the collateral consequences of um, going to prison. A prison term, even for a relatively short period of time, people lose connections to to family. Their children. To, to ch I mean, it's not just the incarcerated individual who is impacted. Um, you know, it impacts their employment, their so, housing, their mental health. Uh, it, it's you know, th this so is something that is really devastating. So you've studied. So you've studied the prisons in Germany, where they you've probably heard seen on 60 Minutes the story about the, where they're. You know, we don't need to get into that. But look, uh, prison reform is really important. Where, where, where they take much better care of their mm -hmm. prisoners, and they don't. I don't think that that nonviolent criminals should go to prison. I mean, I th that's my opinion. I'm not a pundit, but I'm going to give out my opinion. Um, do you think there'll ever be a time in Vermont or in this country where nonviolent offenders don't get put in prison? I mean, possibly. I, I think we also need to look at how long we're sending people to prison uh, for. Um, you, you know, violent offenders spending decades and decades in prison where their you know, incarceration is not necessarily having any public safety benefit. The, the returns are diminishing over time and the costs are going up. Um, you know, you, you alluded to Germany. You know, there, there are many other countries that don't do it this way. They don't do it this way. They do it in a way where they're where the return is like zero and yeah. our, but it's getting worse in our country and we didn't even get into the national stuff which I really wanted to get into because what's going on now in our country and our civil liberties and the, the rule of law and right. all this other stuff is pretty intense. Well, the Campaign for Smart Justice is one of the things is nationally. on your website? The, the, campaign say, for yes. Smart Justice, the website again is the ACLUVT.org. Mm -hmm. Visit the website. Yep. Um, Tell us quickly, we have a minute and a half left. The sure. I mean, I was just going to say, I mean, that's one of several ways in which the ACL, I mean, we were embarked on this, this campaign um, several years ago, um, but it, it's become more important um, with the election of Donald Trump and, of course, with Jeff Sessions at the Department of Justice to really push back against um, a retrograde approach to criminal justice. Um, and it's one of the ways that we are trying to counter um, that we are countering uh, the Trump administration um, from criminal justice to LGBT equality mm. oh um, to heavens. religious to women. discrimination, women. women's rights. Um, I mean, we have our work cut out for us, and so, yes, we need all the help we can get. So I just want to say that the membership <laughs> in nationally and statewide has quadrupled. It's four times bigger than it was at the national level and state level mm. in the last... In the, within the last six to nine months. In the last six to nine months, the membership has quadrupled in both the national and state. Now, you can go online. You can become a member. That's right. Stop on down in Montpelier for the party if you want to stop on down and wish them well on their 50th anniversary. Duff, anything else you want to add before we say goodbye? Our half hour is over. I think Vermont is very lucky to have you here in this new thank role you, and all the great work that. that you're doing. And um, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. And... Uh, for all that you do and the good that you bring into our world. Thank you We need more much. people like you. Thank you You're for having me. You're a good man, my friend. Here. All right. Appreciate to it. To my viewers, good night.